Okay, we might get started. Um, the last few weeks in our uh, departmental seminars have been a bit of a showcase for uh, what's going on here in this department. So we've had um, we had the talk by Candide and Andriana and Marie and then uh, Carolina. And today um, we have another um, talk from our SOS person, and this is um, Sam, Samantha Goodchild. Um, <coughs> first met Sam five years ago when she, six years ago. Oh, seven. seven. It's 2017, yeah, I started in 2010. <laughs> um, so she did her, um, her BA studies at Nottingham, and then came here to do the MAs in uh, documentation and description. And during the MA, she um, did a really interesting study of Mauritian Creole use um, here in London. So looking at how families from Mauritius were dealing with the three, at least three different languages that were available to them, English, French, and Mauritian Creole. And I guess the interest in multi, multilingualism, multi-language, um, really uh, played out in that uh, thesis. And so she's since gone on to do further work in on multilingualism, and uh, particularly where you've got uh, situations uh, where people are choosing to use different languages and mixing and translanguaging, as it's as it's called. Um, so her research um, on the PhD has been based in Senegal, in the southern part of Senegal, um, and she's been looking there at the village level, um, particularly the role of gender in issues of language choice and, and language use. And today we're going to hear about these practices in southern Senegal and from languages to translanguaging in a very postmodern um, field. So, Samantha. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me and thanks for the introduction. Um, you did steal a little bit out of my interest life, but that's fine. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, as Peter said, today I'm going to be talking about multilingual practices in uh, the Casamance in Senegal, showing you a bit of data from my PhD research. Um, and I'll also talk a bit about how I collect data, the various methods that I use. Um, I'll show you a, a couple of, well, one clip actually, um, and some transcripts, and we'll look at how I go about analysing the different uh, multilingual practices before coming on to a wider discussion about languages and translanguaging and what the data that um, I've collected as part of my PhD and also um, our research team can contribute to the discussion. So I'm going to give a bit more background about the Casamance in Senegal, for those of you who don't know, sorry for those who've heard it numerous times from numerous team members. Um, so it's a very picturesque setting in uh, West Africa, in Senegal, and where we work, it's very close to different national borders. So the Casamance is the southern part of Senegal, and above that you have the Gambia and beneath Guinea-Bissau. And these were all different colonies. So Senegal was a French colony, Guinea-Bissau was Portuguese, and the Gambia was a British colony. And all of these national languages also play into the multilingual situation that we have. So as is pretty typical for West Africa, Casamance is highly multilingual, and we have official languages, national languages, and then on a more regional level, different languages that function as lingua francas, and then numerous local languages. Some of these are associated with particular villages, and some uh, have a bit of a wider spread. And then on the individual level of the person, people generally have quite diverse linguistic repertoires, and this aligns with mobility, so it depends where they've been throughout their lives, different villages, towns, countries, where they pick up different languages. So more specifically, um, you can see on the map here, so this is the area um, of the Casamance, and it's super near the border with Guinea-Bissau. It's only about 20 kilometers. Um, 
And this here in the middle of Senegal is the Gambia, but it's only a couple of hours by road. So people frequently cross different borders to see friends and family members and the like. Um, I work as part of a research team. Um, I'll say more about them in a minute. But this, the red dotted line, is the area that we work in. Um, I work in Essil here, and this is uh, the sort of like peninsula area. is a group of ten villages, and those are all associated with um, a language which is referred to as Jola Banjal or Jola Egima, and then other team members work in the villages of Bran and Gibonker, and those two villages are just 500 metres side by side, and they're each associated with their own local language as well. So I'll just give you a wee bit of brief, very brief history before speaking a bit more about the different languages in the area. So not much really is known about uh, the history of the Casamance uh, pre-colonial uh, times. Um, most of it comes from oral history reports. So in the 16 to 1700s, there was um, a large Bainuk kingdom, and then there were different uh, population expansions of Mandinka and Jola people. Um, then in the 1700s, well, first of all, actually, the British tried to uh, establish a base in the Casamance, but it wasn't successful, so they went a bit further north to the Gambia. Then the Portuguese established a garrison in Ziganshaw, um, and this has resulted in a Portuguese Creole, which is still spoken today as one of the regional lingua francas. But the country of Senegal was uh, part of French West Africa, so part of the French colony, and it remained that way until independence. And after independence, French was retained as the official language, as with many different uh, ex-colonial African nations. In the 80s to the early 2000s, there was an armed separatist conflict in the area that we work, in the Casamance, and this led to quite a large population movement. So a lot of people moved between different villages, and they also crossed borders into uh, the Gambia and Guinea-Bissau as well as a result of the conflict. So there's been a high amount of mobility in the region, which has also contributed to a highly diverse linguistic setting. So we'll have a look now at just how multilingual the area uh, really is. So on the macro level, as I've said, the official language of Senegal is French. It's the only language which is used as a medium of communication, medium of education in schools. Um, and it's spoken alongside uh, Senegalese French as well. Um, people vary depending in uh, how well they understand or speak French according to how they've learnt it and their life history, etc. There are also various languages which have the status of national language in Senegal. Um, among these, Wolof, which is the most widely spoken. Um, some 95% of the population speak or understand it to a certain degree. Then we also have uh, Jola, which I'll be coming back to quite a lot throughout my talk. Uh, it's key for the points I want to make. And uh, we also have numerous other languages. Some of them are spoken less in the area I work in. More of them are spoken to the north of, in Senegal. So... In addition to the different uh, national and official languages operating on the macro scale, all of the languages on the slide here are attested in our corpus. Um, we have a Jola group, um, and the village that I work in, Essil, is mostly associated with Jola Egima and Jola Banjal. Um, and some of these languages, such as Jolafoni and Jolakasa, operate as regional lingua francas. 
Um, a lot of them share quite a high proportion of the lexicon, so Kujirai and Egima share about 75% uh, um, of the lexicon. Then we also have other languages from different groups within the same Atlantic family, Bainuk Guberha, Wolof, as I've mentioned before. And in addition to that, we have even more languages. So we have some from the Mande family, uh, numerous Indo-European languages. French is the official language. Um, at school, in high school, children learn both English and Spanish. Um, and numerous participants have traveled quite widely and they've learned German, Italian, and uh, some other European languages as well. And as I said, there's uh, Portuguese Creole. Um, because of a lot of population movement, as I mentioned, um, quite a lot of participants report speaking Guinea-Bissau Creole and some report speaking Casamos Creole. Um, there's some work which is just being done on this at the moment by um, uh, Biagi, uh, Biagi et al. And there's a paper coming out in a new volume quite soon about that. So we'll see if they're the linguists consider them to be different or, or not, <laughs> or whether it's just the participants. So who are the people investigating all of these languages at once? Um, I think this talk was originally billed as a, a crossroads showcase, <laughs> but I think I'm the only one in the country, so I'm representing here today. Um, so before we go on to talk about the other things, I just have to name check everyone in the project. Um, if you want more information, you can always pop on our special website and blog. So the Crossroads project started in 2014, and it's running till the end of next year. Um, we have numerous people in the UK based here at SOAS and also at the University of Sheikh Antajop in Dakar. And we're researching all different types of topics, so phonology, gesture, um, in addition to uh, social linguistic topics like myself. Just take a look at us. Oh, it's blurry. That's good because it's not a good picture. <laughs> Embarrassing picture. And uh, yeah, just a quick shout out to all the team members. So um, our principal investigator is Friederica Lubka, who's based here at SOAS. Um, and then we had three postdoctoral researchers at SOAS, Alex, Abby and Rachel. Then um, that's three UK-based PhD students. And Anne Law is our admin assistant who keeps everyone sane and coherent. Um, and then this is the Senegal team here. Um, the Senegal team leader, two PhD students and our team of transcribers without whom we would not be able to do very much. <laughs> so my role in the team and what I'm going to be concentrating a bit more uh, on for the rest of the talk, I look at the link between multilingualism and mobility, tweaked the PhD a bit since Peter's introduction. <laughs> um, um, so. Why I was particularly interested in this village is that in such a multilingual area, uh, Sanya and Sanya and Bethan have described the village as monolingual, where Jola Egema is dominant. Um, so that already stood out to me that there's purportedly this monolingual village within a highly multilingual area. So I wanted to have a look at what people are actually doing uh, in naturalistic conversations. So I focused a lot on uh, linguistic repertoires and the link with mobility. So when, after people have traveled, when they come back to the village, do they then use the different languages that they've acquired with people or do they revert back to using Jola Egema? And in my work, I've found that it's quite useful to use the translanguaging approach. So I'm introducing it uh, briefly here now. So when we go through and have a look at some of the data and discussions, you can just uh, sort of have it in your mind. 
So translanguaging came about, uh, I think the term came about in Wales, um, and it originally started off as a pedagogical technique in bilingual schools. So in English, Welsh bilingual schools, generally they found that people weren't necessarily mixing languages, but still rigidly would use English in a certain class or to discuss a certain topic and Welsh for another one. And um, people found that uh, children learnt better when they were able to move across and within languages. So um, Garcia and Li Wei have done a lot of work on it and they describe translanguaging as people using their full linguistic repertoires um, and all resources regardless of uh, defined boundaries of named languages. Uh, Jorgensen et al. Um, named the same practice polylanguaging, um, and they say as well that language users use whatever linguistic features are available to them in order to achieve their communicative aims, and that doesn't really matter how well they know any of the languages involved. Um, they can do this fluidly and at ease. So I'll also be using this to ask what JOLA is. So we've already seen that the state, the Republic of Senegal, considered JOLA to be a national language, and also um, certain linguists, uh, Posnyakov and Sejere, consider it to be a group of related languages. Um, it's also worth pointing out as well that lots of the JOLA varieties listed on the slide I just showed aren't yet documented. Um, and in my own data, it varies whether people report JOLA as a language that they speak or whether they list the separate varieties. So keep that in mind. We'll come back to it. <laughs> So before I show you a bit of data, I just wanted to mention about how I collect my data and what methods I use. So um, coming from a social linguistic background, uh, if you hadn't guessed already, I work in a qualitative methodology. Um, and I prefer this as I don't think that the data that I collect is necessarily uh, easily quantifiable and I find it quite difficult to make generalizations across groups of people. Um, when people have such individual repertoires and also there's such a high rate of mobility, I often don't know who's going to be living in the village at any one time, then it's quite difficult for me to generalize about certain language patterns and extend them across um, different groups of people. So I prefer a fine-grained uh, in-depth approach focusing on a few case studies. And I also find that um, using this sort of methodology allows for um, a lot more reflexive practice. So I think a lot about the different methods I'm using and I also include myself and my own presence in the analysis of my data and in my write-up as well. So I use a variety of different methods from different fields. Um, so I've done a fair amount sort of from an ethnographic approach um, to include different viewpoints and voices in my work. So what do people think about their own language use? Um, and to do this, I take detailed field notes and do a lot of participant observation, engaging in people's uh, daily lives. Um, a lot of my recorded data is naturalistic. Um, I call it naturalistic because obviously your presence as a researcher is going to affect the data that you collect, but the mere fact that you're there shouldn't necessarily be a problem if you take it into account uh, in your analysis. Um, so I've divided up my recordings into staged and observed communicative events. Um, and basically how I consider them different is if um, I've asked a participant to do something specifically, uh, like take time out of their day to come and do an interview with me, then it's staged 
and if I've just tagged along with them and I'm not interrupting their day in any way, um, and they would normally be doing um, some washing up or something, and I just happen to be recording their conversation while they're having up, um, while they're washing up, that's observed. And I've also done a lot of semi-structured interviews to get uh, linguistic biographical data too. Uh, we've collected an awful lot of data uh, with the team. Um, I have personally over 30 hours of different types of data and I've currently got about half of it transcribed so far. Um, most of that is actually the naturalistic data and the interviews which weren't conducted in French for the other ones. Um, I've gone through and just annotated some of them. Um, there's a lot of different issues which um, have come up through doing this research. Um, and particularly in such a highly multilingual setting, I found that the languages which are used to carry out the research can have quite a significant effect on the data which people um, give, how they describe their different languages in different languages. Okay. So I have a little look at some data. Um, I have two excerpts I wanted to show you. I can only show you one though um, due to consent issues. So we'll watch a clip of one video and then we'll just have a look at the transcript of the other one. Um, people agreed to share within our research team but not to the public I'm afraid. Um, so to have a look at what um, Jola is and what I think is happening in the clips, we're going to focus on one participant, DS4, and her language use. Um, the other participants in the clips have different repertoires, but excuse me, they all share a Jola variety. Um, so the two different contexts, one of them is a women's work group who are harvesting rice in the rice field. And the second one is a meeting of the Women's Catholic Association. Um, and beforehand, I'd been told that both of these would be completely monolingual Jola Egima situations. And I sort of I asked why people are coming from lots of different areas and villages to attend these meetings. Would it not be easier to use some other language? Um, and people would describe it as. Um, it's like an inclusive way of including everyone because most people are likely to speak one of the Jola varieties. Okay, so let's have a look at the clip. The new version of Prezi makes you pay to put a video in. So I think I'm just going to go back to PowerPoint next time. Okay, it's only 20, 20 seconds, so it's very short. Um, this here, this is DS4, um, and it will be clearer when we have a look at the transcript. Subtitles worked a little bit better earlier on. There's always something. <laughs> okay, so it's a pretty short clip. Um, were you able to follow anything? Should I play it again?
Okay, so the subtitle's not quite as snazzy as I'd hoped, but we'll have a look at the transcript anyway. So in the clip, um, we just have the transcription and then the translation. Um, so when we look at our data, we don't start out by uh, us, the researchers, looking at it and wondering, OK, what languages are in here? What languages are they switching between? So um, what we do, um, me and uh, my colleague Miriam Vidal presented a, a slightly different version of this um, last year at LDLT5. Um, so we've called it the triangulation of analyses, which makes it sound nice and sciencey. Um, and we think that in order to analyse any bit of natural data like that, we need to have three things, which is um, a speaker's report which um, we'll come on to in a, in a bit, but that's essentially what does the speaker say uh, that they're doing about their language use. Um, an observer's report, so that's the second party, and that could be someone such as a local research assistant or a transcriber. And also then lastly, um, our report about what we think is going on. So in the middle of the triangle, we have things like experience, knowledge, and attitudes. So this is, there could be anything there, and these are all things which will influence people's uh, analyses of what's going on with the data. And then we also have these arrows of influence, because uh, we feel that people can influence each other. So um, particularly the researcher and the speaker. If I'm doing an interview with someone, I've found that quite often I've prompted uh, particular language names. Um, and the observers, uh, so the transcribers and the researchers, work a lot more closely together, and I found that we can influence them as well. Um, this is a slightly thinner arrow because I found that there's a bit less influence there, but I think it really depends on perhaps how many people you're working with. But it's a possibility, so I've put a thin arrow in there. Okay, so to have a look at uh, DS4's language use and what's going on, we have to have a look at the three different um, analyses. So what does she say she does? Um, for this, we need linguistic uh, biographical data, information about her linguistic repertoire. And this is the part of it which doesn't really require any expertise in linguistics, obviously, from the speaker. It's their self-report on what they're, they're doing. So here at the top, we have DS4 and the different languages which she says she speaks in her linguistic repertoire. So she says French, Jola, which she lists as a separate language, Jola Banjal, Jola Fony, and Wolof. It was quite interesting um, during the, one of the interviews that I did with her, which I did in French, um, She's just told me before um, line one that she comes from Tangyem, which is a village to the north in uh, the Casamons. So it's not in the same area. Um, so I didn't know about this village, first time I'd heard of it. So I asked her, OK, Tangyem, is that the same Jola as is spoken here? So the brackets here indicate overlapping speech. So before I finish speaking, she interjects with, yes, it's the same Jola. And then I finished speaking at the same time, and then because I've said, is it the same as here, then she corrects herself and says, no, 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 it's not the same Jola as here. It's completely different, but she feels that she can't speak one or the other without mixing them together. And she's lived in Essil now for 16 years and speaking Jola Egima on a daily basis, but she still feels that it's quite difficult to separate out the languages. So that's what she thinks she does. She thinks she mixes the languages. And we also have um, the idea of Jola being similar and different. Uh, 
And when we have a look at what the transcribers think, um, so the observer, like I said, it could be a transcriber or a, a research assistant, and generally they would have a wider background knowledge about the social linguistic setting, um, and they would often have received topic-related training, so perhaps from the researchers. So in our case, um, the postdocs trained up the team of transcribers in multilingual transcription techniques um, using the Senegalese alphabet for writing in national languages. So even, all the langu even though all of the languages in the area haven't been documented or codified, they still um, transcribe them using the Senegalese alphabet. So when we have a look at the transcript of the clip I just showed you, this is from uh, the transcriber DS. So he says in the first segment, she's speaking Jolo Banjal and uh, Fonyi. And in the second segment, uh, Jolo Banjal, Fonyi, and also French. In the first section, though, the only Fonyi uh, word which he identifies is Jakum, and the rest is Jola Egima. Whereas in the other segment, there's. Um, oh, it's blocked it out anyway. The uh, first bit is Jola Egima, and then the second bit uh, is Jola Fonyi. And there's French under the blue bit because the lines moved. Okay, so with um, the transcriber DS, he consistently transcribes DS4's language use as Jolophonie mixed with Jola Egima, and occasionally some French lexical items, and that's consistently across contexts, across um, transcription files, um, in lots of different contexts. Then, fairly recently, I had another um, transcription back from the transcribers, and it was from um, the transcriber ACB. Um, and in a cut of 15 minutes, he'd only marked one instance of Jolophony, and the rest of it he transcribed as Jola Egima. Um, bear in mind, she says that she has great difficulty in separating the two languages, and um, is from a Jola Fonyi speaking area. So we have uh, this phrase here, which is the only uh, segmental phrase that the transcriber says is in Jola Fonyi. And for the rest of the clip, everything is apparently in Jola Banjal. So it's not the same clip we were looking at before, but it really stood out for me across my files. So I made me really think, okay, what's really going on here? So finally, after getting all of the other information from the researcher, sorry, from the speakers and the observers, then I have a look at the file. So for us, it may be the case that we have the least experience in the setting, uh, not always. Um, and we've obviously received uh, linguistic, social linguistic training, which is influencing our methods and analyses. So as I said, um, when I come to look at it, we have, well, I don't necessarily think it's conflicting information, but we have different information from uh, different parties. So just to recap, DS4 reports not being able to separate the two languages, and she also reports Jola as a separate language. Um, in the second excerpt, we only have one instance of Jola Fonyi, um, but also other participants in the clip, most of them respond speaking Jola Fonyi as part of their repertoire, so in theory there wouldn't have been uh, some sort of comprehension problem if she had chosen to speak Jola Fonyi. Um, but for me, I think the key for the different... Um, transcriber ACB, I realized that uh, DS actually knows DS4, um, and it's obviously probably would be quite a common uh, occurrence if you're working in small communities with small language groups. A lot of people are going to 
know a lot of your participants. So it transpired that he did know her and he knows that she's from a Jolofoni speaking area, whereas um, ACB didn't know her at all, didn't have any idea about her background or uh, linguistic repertoire. So for me that was also quite interesting because um, the transcriber has, uh, he speaks all of the languages in his repertoire as well. So in theory, he should be able to identify when Jolofoni is being spoken. Then when I have a look at the transcription, um, all I can see is French, which is not marked by the transcribers. So uh, we have uh, communion and serre, which means tight. Um, but the transcribers don't know instances uh, such as this. Okay. So, we've got various different takes on the same data. So, what I wanted to have a look at now is to consider then if the data is the same, um, why should we perhaps change our approach to uh, analysing and thinking about the data? Um, sort of moving away from looking at discrete and bounded languages towards a more practice-oriented approach. Um, and for me, it's quite important um, to question sort of who decides where the boundaries of various languages are, whether it's the speakers or documentary linguists whose opinions are being represented um, in the analyses. And also, um, if we're going to use a translanguaging approach, does this mean that we have to totally disregard uh, concepts of bounded languages? So, um, sort of in the past 10 or so years, particularly in sociolinguistics, um, there's uh, been sort of a turn from looking at um, the structure of languages to uh, more, more of a focus on people, uh, the context of situated language use, um, focusing on people's repertoires, their um, biographies and their histories, um, to sort of incorporate as well people's perspectives into um, sort of a more holistic understanding of language use. And this also fits with um, different approaches. So people, for example, who might be analysing similar data using code switching or code mixing would be using much more of a structuralist approach, um, whereas uh, a lot of the work done on translanguaging and similar terms comes from a post-structuralist idea. So, um, a lot of work has been done on uh, translingual practice by Kanigaraja. Um, there's lots of different terminology kicking around uh, translanguaging. So we have terms such as polylanguaging, translingual practice, languaging. I think there's even more. Uh, but they're all essentially describing the same thing, which is uh, people's linguistic practices regardless of these bounded languages. And uh, Kanigaraja himself says that it's quite difficult to speak about uh, new approaches and paradigms like this without using terminology from older paradigms. Um, so even if we're talking about linguistic practices, it is quite difficult to do that without speaking about named languages. Um, and he says, that obviously labelled languages and language varieties still have a reality for social groups. Um, so we can't dismiss them sort of offhand. Um, they form important parts of people's linguistic practices. And this move as well towards uh, translanguaging also considers as well um, 
spatiality. So we're, again, concentrating a lot on the context and the situation in which uh, different communicative practices take place. So um, this also allows a lot of accommodation of diversity and unpredictability. Um, but quite a nice um, way of conceiving of languages has come out from our research group. Um, so Rachel Watson is one of our postdoctoral fellows and she's been considering um, languages as categories using prototype theory. So um, instead of sort of um, there being a category of French, she would argue that there are certain words that are more prototypical of French than other ones. Um, so Taylor says that humans make categories around um, the conceptual core of, uh, of a category. So not using language as an example. Many people have an image of what a, a, a cat looks like. And that would be your prototypical cat. Maybe it's a black Halloween cat, and it's nice and fluffy, and it has four legs. Then there are other types of cats which are further away from what you consider the prototype to be. So perhaps one of the sphinx hairless cats, for me that's a bit further away from the prototype, or a lion, it's still a cat. But we can, all, we can class them as cats, but depending on your culture or uh, individual people, we will have a different idea of what the sort of best example or a prototypical example of that category is. So Rachel's decided to apply this to the concept of languages in our research setting. So for her, that means uh, different linguistic elements. Perhaps it's a word or pronunciation or some form of construction will be more prototypical of certain languages than others. Um, so this allows for a lot of variation between speakers. Um, so I don't know if this might help, but um, this is an adaptation of a Venn diagram from uh, one of her papers, which is coming out quite soon. So for example, for Jola Egima, which is, I've put in the blue circle here, for example, um, there's a feature which isn't shared with any other Jola languages. So they use the voiced G, um, and all of the other Jola varieties use K, the unvoiced. Um, so you would put uh, go in like in the Jola Egimo part at the top, um, and then something for Jola Kijirai, which is more typical, would be here, and then sort of the shared 70% of the shared lexicon would be sort of this bit here between Jola Egimo and Jola Kijirai, and then you can add many other different languages on, and then this overlap here which I've added in Jola, uh, is what I'm interested in. So where do things overlap and what does uh, this mean? So I posit that the, the bit in the middle of all of the, the languages, of all of the Jola languages, is not necessarily a language, but is rather a, a languaging practice, so how people communicate. Um, so if people do want to, they can speak the separate languages using phrases or words or pronunciations which are more prototypical of the others, but for a lot of forms, it's quite difficult to tell which Jola language is being used. And this is also why I think in the second clip, we have everything in Banjal for DS4's language use and only one instance of Jolophonie because in that instance she's using a form which is prototypical of Jolophonie whereas many of the other forms in the rest of the clip are shared. But because the recording took place in Esil where people expect Jola Egima to be spoken the transcriber is like primed for hearing Jola Egima and then only when DS4 uses the, the
the really prototypical funny phrase, does he then transcribe it as such? So I think that you don't, although <laughs> some people when they talk about translanguaging have gone so far to say that there's not necessarily these separate languages, I don't think that's necessarily the case in our research uh, area. Um, and also for my sort of my idea about Jola as a languaging practice, there's a little bit of support from a couple of other um, research settings. So um, uh, Kasper Uffermans works in the Gambia, so it's very close to the Casamance and it's a very similar uh, multilingual setting to what we work in. Um, so he did his the, this 2015 study, he actually looked at multilingualism, literacy, and uh, linguistic practices. Um, and the quote here was taken from a series of interviews which he did with people when he asked, what language would you like to see taught in schools? And the respondents were very resistant to naming any particular language and instead they preferred to talk about uh, black people's language, which wasn't any particular language, but was more a representation of how they communicate using different languages without necessarily assigning them a particular name. Um, and, well, Euphemon even goes so far to say that now the, the field of social linguistics has sort of changed from the Fishmanian paradigm of who speaks what, to who, where, as to who languages what, uh, to whom, when, with what resources, and under what conditions, which is, again, taking the focus away from the separate structured languages and moving it on to people's practices. And another um, study which is coming out quite soon, uh, I had a preview of the paper on uh, academia, is by uh, Isabel uh, Leglise. So she works in the French Guiana uh, Suriname border area, which is uh, in South America, which is uh, again highly multilingual. And there are lots of different languages from different language families spoken there. So it's uh, sort of a fairly similar situation to ours, where there's a group of related languages and then ones from different language families. Um, she has some really interesting data. Um, so in a couple of her conversations, there's data and you can't tell which language is being spoken. It could be one of two, and that's for every single linguistic element. Um, and she found that actually speakers prefer to use these ambiguous forms, which you can't associate with one language or another, particularly when communicating with people who they don't know, so they don't know their linguistic repertoire. So they actually prefer to choose these forms which are shared among different languages, which I think is what is happening with Jola. So I think when people report speaking Jola, they report being able to speak different Jola varieties, but also to use these ambiguous forms which are shared among the different varieties. Um, and they're doing this as an inclusive uh, linguistic practice. As people said to me before, not everyone speaks French or Wolof, but many people will speak one Jola variety. So there's a fair chance that they over speak some of the overlapping forms in the middle. Just a, a brief conclusion to try and bring everything back together. So, Serge uh, Sanya describes uh, ESSO as being a monolingual area. So, even though I don't necessarily agree with him, I think that, um, that no, that's not true. It's not that I don't agree with him. I think that we can include ESSO as a, as a monolingual area if we take a, a different approach, a translanguaging approach. 
So um, Essil can be seen as a prototypical area in which to speak uh, Jola Egima. Um, and this forms part of a wider uh, Jola linguistic practice, which is spoken in uh, Essil, the Crossroads area, and beyond. If we take um, the prototype approach, then we still have uh, separate languages with social meaning for speakers. Um, and I think that all of these uh, different uh, situations exist together in the same highly multilingual area. Um, and it's sort of one of the reasons why I think that conducting social linguistic research in this area is so interesting and challenging. And that's me. Customary flick through the references. Thank you. <laughs> Well, um, Serge is actually going to begin um, a, a project on child language acquisition. So we should have some uh, ideas soon. But um, there's a particular type of, um, sort of language acquisition strategy which tends to be used in that area. Um, so Calvé and Dreyfus refer to it as a séjour linguistique. So it's like a a language trip or a language uh, stay. So um, fostering is quite widely practiced in the region. So um, if uh, a family, there's an aunt and uncle who don't have any children, um, then quite often their um, brothers and sisters will send children to go and live with them for a while. But particularly in the Casamance area, this will generally be to a, a village or an area that has a different um, social linguistic setting, so different languages are spoken there. Um, so children will pick them up, um, and also this is also practiced by adults as well. So one of um, the friends that I made in uh, in Bram, in one of the villages, um, she, I think it was last year, she just went to, um, she knew someone in uh, Jembarang, a village which is on the coast, and they speak uh, Jola Kwatai. I was like, why are you going there? She's like, I want to learn Kwatai. So people just go for a month to a different village to learn different languages, and it's sort of cemented as a practice uh, from, from childhood. But um, how they learn to differentiate, but also to move between them, we don't have the data yet. But hopefully soon, just some inklings. Yeah, because I guess the question is not so much the... Um as you say, you've got this overlapping core shared between mm -hmm. them. Is how do people actually separate them off and say, well, this one is funny, this one is... Well, that's, I think, where the prototypes really work, because for a lot of it, it doesn't seem to be able to be separated. But when there are the distinct features, then, then people can. Otherwise, I think we get the instance, like in the, the second transcript, where you get, oh, that's default, Jola Egima, and only things that diverge from that will be marked differently. Um, of a particular group or in general? Um, of Jola in particular and then overall. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't necessarily know an awful lot about the historical social linguistic side of it, um, but the original uh, inhabitants of the region were um, the Bainuk population um, and then there was a sort of like a Jola expansion and a lot of, of the um, original Bainuk um, people were incorpor incorporated 
into sort of other ethnicities or language groups. So in some of the languages you see um, there's some similarities between Bainu Kunjola and in some they're a bit further away. And on the list that I showed there's a couple Aramean Bayot which are sort of controversially included within the Jola group because um, people think, well, Sejere and Poznikov posit that, that um, we don't really know, but they think that there was, those languages were originally a lot more different, but they became similar through um, convergence, so through language contact with different groups. But we don't really have all the data on it. So um, some of the Jola varieties are quite specific to different villages, um, and some are used more widely. Um, and in addition, each one will have its own sort of social linguistic setting, so that people who speak those varieties will be in contact with different speakers of lots of different languages. But more than that, I don't know. <laughs> Can you tell us more about this distinction between speaking and, say, language, and how how you interpret this with your own? Like, why would you notice that they are speaking different language? I don't think different approach. Mm -hmm. But really, what's the difference? Well, essentially, the data is the same. People are just doing the same thing. Yeah. So that's. I can see that there's there's not necessarily a difference in the data or what people are doing. People have been speaking like this for for a long time. But um, I think for me, I still refer to the fact that people speak different languages. Um, it's still a concept which people talk about and they're familiar with. But it particularly before I really had some of my interview data um, and before I did focus groups, I still was quite fixated on the different on languages and how many languages do people speak. Um, but particularly when I was getting answers such as Jola in my data, I really started to, to wonder what was going on, particularly when the um, postdocs were, who were looking more at uh, syntax and semantics and things. They, there's, there was so much overlap that they, they were, at one point they were looking at which languages borrowed certain forms from other languages, but they just couldn't pull anything mm -hmm. apart. And I originally was sort of quite, not, not dismissive, but if people said to me, or I said in interviews, what languages or so do you speak? And they would say Jola. Then I'd always prompt and say, okay, well, I know there's loads of different Jolas. So which Jola? The Jola from where? And m lots of people would still insist, no, Jola. So that sort of made me sort of think a bit differently about it. Um, and then I did um, a focus group on what people think about sort of multilingualism, Jola and languages. Um, and actually, I don't think I mentioned it, but it fits in quite nicely with the prototype theory of Rachel's. Um, the participants were speaking about Jola and they described it as something that's really vast. Um, and then the moderator said, OK, so what about everything else? What do we do with it? Is Jola Egima a language? And uh, one of the participants said, no, 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 those are all categories. So they didn't classify them as language, but as categories. So that fits in quite nicely with, with Rachel's, but essentially it's still people speaking to each other and communicating. It's just a different way of theorizing what they're doing, but putting the focus really on the communicative event rather than starting with these sort of a priori assumptions about where the boundaries of certain languages are. But um, one of our, our colleagues in Senegal is still working on like code switching from a more structuralist approach, so I don't think that they need to be separate. Um, it's sort of better to get all of the approaches working together. Thank you. Thank you. It was very interesting. 
Um, I'm curious about the language practice at school. If you have any data, or you said that the, the <laughs> language of instruction is French. Yeah. But uh, as you know, the trans language was a very significant idea to um, talk about language practice at school. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, if you have any ideas or have any data or anything like that. Um, I didn't get any permission to do recorded data, but I did um, observe a few classes in the school. So in the village of Essel, they just have school, um, the first stage of school, so up to the age of 10. Um, and then children have to go to another village to attend middle school. Um, generally, what I saw, um, children in that area before they start school only um, have some familiarity with French. So generally, in the first couple of years, it's very much a focus on like a transitional bilingualism aiming towards French monolingualism still. Um, there are still reports that um, a lot of the children, once they get into the upper two years of school, are being, um, uh, like being forced to wear like a symbol if they speak Jola Egima instead of French in class. But for the younger years, it's really the main medium of communication, which is used to teach French in the first couple of years to get children ready for the latter stages. Um, so they're not allowed to use Jola or any other language at all? So in theory, no. But they, they do for the first few years. And they do in the playground and everything as well. But um, a couple of the teachers who come from outside of the area, so when I was in my second field trip, uh, a week before me, a new teacher had arrived, and he was meant to be taking the, the like, uh, nursery class, like the smallest class, but he didn't speak any Jola languages at all. He came from Dakar and just spoke Wolof French and I think Mandinka, and he had to swap with another teacher because the children didn't understand what was going on. Um, and the other teacher used French, uh, sorry, used Jola as a medium to teach French, but that's really still the focus on the education system, getting them to, to sort of acquire French sort of as a monolingual, uh, yeah. And how proficient do they become in the end, I mean, French? Or do all children across the board become very proficient in no, it depends really um, how late they stay in school um, and if they progress to the secondary school or not. Um, I think also recently in the last year or so the school system changed so they used to have to do a leaving exam at the end of primary school to be able to progress to secondary school and many students wouldn't pass it but that's now sort of been, I think they still have to take the exam, but they're allowed to progress anyway. Um, so there's quite a lot of, of variety, really. And also, even though um, French is mainly acquired in school, it's not the only way to acquire French. So particularly, a lot of women um, in the village where I work have acquired French through going to work as uh, domestic workers in the town, working for French families or French-speaking families. Um, from other African countries. So it's not the only sort of way to acquire French, but it does sort of create lots of different tiers of, of French speakers. I have a practical question about mm -hmm. um, when you talk about the kind of triangulation and you have those three different sources, mm -hmm. how do you store that information and where does that end up? So you have the airline files from the transcribers. Yeah. Uh, and you've made some, I mean, do you, do you add in the extra information about French? Do you add in stuff about... On the, on the files? Yeah. You know, yeah, so we have like a, um, there's a separate column. So I showed you the version which is before it gets to me. So um, we have the transcription column. Then there's uh, one for, well, I added this in, <laughs> translation into English for the subtitles. Then we have a note section. 
So um, when the transcribers get it, they have to transcribe it and then uh, translate it into French and mark it for which languages they think are being spoken in each segment. Then um, when we get it, we have a note section so we can go through and comment on and add things if we want to. Um, and then we would save the two, I save the two separate versions. So before I get it and then after I get it. <laughs> um, and then yeah, you add English for the presentations. Um, and then... Are they transcribing Excel? Or how, how do you no, in Mm-hmm. Um, did you mean like storage and things as well, or um, did that answer it? Yeah, no, no, that, that helps. I, I was wondering, I suppose because you're mostly doing calls, you're taking the call to a project, you know, you matters less, but I was thinking more about um, things like where you have job and sometimes that kind of central job area is being interpreted as the default for that area, and other times it's being interpreted as the default for what the person knows about that speaker, mm -hmm. whether that ends up uh, kind of skewing the data. Yes, I think it does, but I don't necessarily think it skews the data. I think it's like another, yeah, another take on it. If like you were to just sort of take the data at face value and what the transcribers say about it, then I think it is. You could say that like the data is skewed in a certain way. But because we have like a team and we check it with different transcribers, and then also we have our take on it and the the speaker's take, it doesn't necessarily mitigate sort of the bias, but it does give you different perspectives on the same data. Um, perhaps the the postdocs have a, a different take on it if they're, when they're working more with the and they've got Excel sheets and Excel sheets of all these different. Uh, paradigms, noun class paradigms for all the different languages and the overlaps. So they, they deal with their data in a bit of a different way. It sound, it's really impressive and I think you're right that you need kind of including all of those things is great. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just impressed that you can keep track of all. <laughs> yeah, I also use um, Envivo as well, which is quite good for tracking qualitative data because you can pull lots of different things in. So if you export your LN files as Excel or tab delimited text and you can pull it in there and then it works in like a node hierarchy which you can create yourself and you can also include things like photos and videos. Um, so I pull things in there and then you have, you can create people and links between people. So then I, in that I would say that DS4 knows DS in this capacity and in each LN file it, the transcribers have to say who like they put it in the little field who's transcribing it so you can track it and sort of track the relationships between the speakers and transcribers and things. As you're talking about methodology, I think the, the methodology is very interesting, very innovative. And you mentioned uh, about the fact that don't exclude yourself, mm -hmm. the researcher, you consider yourself as part of the research. So could you give us some more examples maybe of how, sure. how this happened throughout your, your research? Yeah, um, so I think it sort of started in the first trip I went on, which was quite short, and we just did um, a couple of sort of semi-structured interviews with people um, and I went through afterwards and they were in French and I transcribed them and I don't think, oh yeah, and then I pulled out from this, it was just a discussion with someone about what languages she speaks um, and I pulled out quotes from it to use in a paper um, about how she said that Jola is her, her mother tongue. And I thought, oh, this is really great. It's nice data. Then the next year I went back and revisited it and I watched the, the clip again. And I realized that if you just take her out of it and not me, then you actually miss how I've sort of prompted her. Because if you go a couple of, like a, I think it's a minute back, then 
she, we're talking about French, and she says, oh, my French is really dreadful. And I was like, no, 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 no. It's like way better than mine. My French is dreadful. It's not even my mother language. I said, like, English is my mother tongue. And so I've sort of already, I, the idea is in, like, her head. And then when you watch the video back, you can see when she says it, she says, because I said it, like, in a particular way as well, I said, like, uh, anglais, c'est ma langue maternelle à moi. And she repeats the exact same phrase when she says, ah, jola, c'est ma langue maternelle à moi. <laughs> so, it, but taking it out of the context without including me is, is sort of quite, yeah, it sort of gave me a, a different reading on it. Um, so I guess that was one instance. And then also people learn English uh, in schools, like I said, so when we're around, people are always trying out English and it just makes the whole multilingual setup a lot more uh, a lot more different but yeah I think Mia did a, a piece on um, uh, the so using the communities of practice approach so we have a, a base where the transcribers work in the village of Bran and if we're in Bran and we're going to work with the transcribers then we go along and she actually did a little study of our language use among us and the, the transcribers and how we're all sort of influencing each other and learning all of the different languages, which is quite interesting. But um, yeah, it, there, there are like some serious parts of my research where it's like if I take myself out of this, I've got a totally different view on it. And also people speak about me. So when um, so even if you're doing like a participant observation recording or something, then quite often you see people being spoken about or people will say, oh, Sam's around, you have to speak, Jola Egima. And then you listen back and you're like, all of the languages, multilingualism. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there are all these uh, different sort of language ideologies to navigate, but um, yeah. a few different points really. I'm wondering if you, um, you or anyone in the team is looking at, say, a particular individual mm -hmm. going to different locations and then seeing what they do in terms of their language practices according to who's there and who they're talking to mm -hmm. and so on. Well, we did, um, as part of the team, we did a social network study. Um, and as part of that, we chose two key participants from each of the three villages. And then they were mic'd up with pretty much something like this, a lapel mic and a really small dictaphone. Um, and then their language use was recorded throughout the day and there was no restrictions on where they could go or who they met or anything. Um, and we've used some the because of like consent issues and things. So there were big village meetings where we said, okay, on certain days, so-and-so is going to be wearing the mic and we'll be walking around. Um, so just be aware of that. And particularly, actually, in my village, um, my participant would, before he started a conversation, would always really draw attention to it and be like, look, I'm wearing the mic, is this okay? Which I think some team members weren't that okay with because it sort of interrupted the flow of conversations, but I don't mind because then you definitely know that you've got like good consent for that and after 30 seconds, they forget anyway. Um, so on a couple of instances, people did go to other villages and we also found that a, a lot of people from sort of the other villages would come as well. So I've got um, some nice data where I think it's a couple of Rachel's key participants have just come around for lunch in one of my participants' house. And we've got some really nice data there where it's sort of, again, it's the whole Jola thing. Some bits have been marked as Jola Kajira, some as Jola Banjao. And a lot of it, I think, is just Jola. Mm -hmm. um, but I would like to have a bit more uh, of a uh, defined approach to see different people, especially when they go further afield, not just within our area, but what happens when they go to town as mm -hmm. well. OK, well, I think Sam's opened up a whole bunch of different perspectives on ways of looking at multilingual um, contexts like this. So 
Well, let's thank her for a really interesting talk.